Good afternoon and welcome to our fifth online seminar for our online course about the referendum. Now we know the result, we'll be discussing uh, what happened and what happens next. Um, I'm joined today by our usual panel of Professor Charlie Jeffrey and Professor Nicola McEwen and we are of course ready to welcome your comments uh, through Twitter and also through the Future Learn website. Today we have uh, four topics for discussion, uh, the future of Scotland, uh, the future of the UK, the implications for the political parties and what implications might there be also for civic engagement going forward. But we start today with the future of Scotland and the idea of further powers uh, for Scotland. So Janet Penny asks this question. Um, she says that she noted that Nicola McEwen uh, during the election coverage has said that if the Yes campaign secures 45%, that's still an extraordinary achievement sufficient to keep alive the issue of the continued journey for Scottish self-government. As her suggestion has proved accurate, um, could she please elaborate on this? Nicola, <laughs> well predicted. I wish I was always that accurate. <laughs> um, yes, I mean, I always thought that so long as the Yes campaign avoided a very heavy defeat, then it was going to be a win-win situation because if you remember at the start of this process when the SNP was elected to government in 2011, went forward with its commitment for an independence referendum, they were nowhere near uh, looking at 45% support for independence. For a long time, for many years, it sat at around about a third, sometimes uh, quite a bit lower than that. And so to, to get to the point of having 45% support for Scottish independence, even in the context of that kind of campaign where there were a lot of risks raised and fears raised perhaps, um, then it, that, that is a significant achievement that does keep alive the debate about Scotland's place within the United Kingdom. And I don't think uh, that the proposals that are on offer um, by the UK parties, uh, which are of course subject to agreement between them, will be enough to um, stop or halt further debates about um, it strengthening Scottish self-government within, within the Union. I don't think an independence referendum anytime soon is likely. I don't think the SNP will return uh, with a manifesto commitment to a referendum, another referendum anytime soon. Um, but it will revert to uh, the strategy that it's had for a long time, which has been a, a gradualist, incrementalist uh, approach to strengthening its uh, self-government uh, for the Scottish Parliament. Charlie, do you want to say something about that? Well, in a, in a sense, um, we, we are seeing the evidence for, for, for Nicola's statement on, on referendum night in the uh, establishment of the group around Lord Smith of, of Kelvin yeah. to extend the current devolution settlement. Uh, there, is, there are plenty of questions about that, and I know we'll come to them uh, shortly. Uh, one of them, uh, though perhaps a crucial one, is the extent to which the, the SNP will engage with that process, because uh, Labour, the Conservatives and the Liberal Democrats each had their commission on, on devolution, each producing proposals around which there's some common ground, but um, also the Lib Dems and the Conservatives are more ambitious more extensive on their tax proposals than, than Labour are. And there's a question there for me about the SNP's positioning in that uh, debate. Um, it has, um, uh, back in, uh, in 2010, published a, a vision of, of full fiscal uh, autonomy, which would be way beyond what anything, uh, anything offered by the other parties. The question is, would it, would it enter this debate with something which isn't that maximal, maximal position, but which could be a basis for engagement with the fuller devolution positions of the Conservatives and the Liberal Democrats, in a sense isolating Labour. It might be a, a, a partisan temptation to do so, and I think that's going to be an interesting thing to look out for in the, in the coming weeks. Mm. <coughs> Moving on from that, Charlie, we've had, I want to combine two questions. One from um, Jane Ann Erickson, who says, will the promises David Cameron made to the Scottish people actually be fulfilled? She, she thinks that it seems that there's already be some backpedalling. And then a question from Elspeth Baird who asks, will there be a race to the bottom and an agreement on the Labour offer, which is the least generous one, and what will this say about David Cameron's promise? So, Nicola, do you think there has been some backpedalling or do you think this is something that's going to go forward? And where do you, where do you I mean, see the outlines of the agreement? Not backpedalling, because there wasn't an agreement 
to backpedal from. There was an agreement to agree to something. Um, and it remains the case that there are significant differences. Overlaps, yes, but significant differences between what the three parties offered. Um, I've always thought it would be very difficult um, for the Labour Party to go much further than the commitments it gave. It was already quite a difficult process internally for the party to get to where it got. So um, for it to, to raise the bar in a sense and, and match the Conservatives, say, on uh, full, full income tax devolution um, would be politically difficult. I also think that the time frame makes it practically difficult to go forward with those more ambitious proposals um, because the, the advantage, in a sense, of the Labour Party's proposals is that they extend, essentially, the system that's already um, being implemented for the Scotland Act 2012. Um, so it's building on a process that's already in train, um, if not yet introduced. Mm. So in the time frame that's available, it's easier to envisage that kind of proposal than a wholesale transformation, which I think uh, the, the Conservatives and the Liberal Democrats tax proposals would imply. Um, so one, th one area that might be difficult um, is the Labour's progressive tax uh, policy, which was um, to allow the Scottish Parliament to raise uh, the higher and additional rates of income tax for redistributive purposes, but not to decrease them. And I find it difficult to, I think it would be very politically difficult for the Conservatives in particular to agree to a, a policy which was essentially a tax raising policy, but not tax reducing policy. So there, it's not just about what, what the parties can agree within Scotland, it's what the parties can uh, tolerate within the context of their debates beyond Scotland too, and the wider ramifications that any compromises it would imply. There are particular difficulties about the welfare policies, but perhaps mm. we'll come back to that. So you think something will happen, but we just don't know quite well, what yet? Well, something will happen. Eh? Okay. I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm certain of that. Right. Um, be enormously difficult for nothing to happen. But I don't think that something that will happen will settle the constitutional question. I think that right. debate will continue. OK. Charlie? I, I agree. I think it's inconceivable <coughs> um, for us not to see... Um, uh, a, a set of legislative proposals prior to the UK election on some form of further reaching devolution for Scotland. Uh, I think it's inconceivable because there's there's plenty of recognition of the kind of mythology of 1979 when it 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 was it was felt that the Conservatives had promised, well, vote no to, to devolution and we'll sort something out afterwards. That mythology played very strongly through this referendum campaign. It would be toxic, uh, I think, for the pro-union parties in Scotland to, to fail to deliver on, on that commitment and I'm sure they'll deliver on it in, in some form. There, there, there's, there's one point, one of the questioners, and you, you introduced this, asked about um, the, the commitments extending beyond the UK election. Well, I think the purpose of this is to tie in the three pro-union parties which will have in some combination a majority at the UK level after the election to, to act. So I don't, I don't think that's an issue. There is another issue which is parliamentary and that's what the Scottish Parliament has to say about this. Because the timetable set out doesn't uh, provide um, scope for the kind of scrutiny that the Scottish Parliament will want to give to the proposals that will be brought forward. Um, we can be sure that the Scottish Parliament will want to set up a committee and to take evidence and to give full scrutiny uh, to what comes. But it seems as if that's going to have to wait until after the UK election. So it's the, the UK level parties, in a sense, the pro-union parties, possibly with the SNP engaging, we'll see, uh, which will say, well, this is what Scotland gets, and then the Scottish Parliament can debate it. And I, I wonder about the, uh, the sense in that. Uh, I know we're stuck with this timetable, but that's one of the... Uh, the reasons why this timetable is um, at the very least suboptimal because it doesn't allow um, proper debate in Scotland about what the Scottish Parliament's powers should be going forward. Mm. I, th I think the SNP will engage with it. Um, it was interesting to see uh, the First Minister's speech yesterday in Parliament where he introduced three 
key tests, and I've just pulled this up here, the three key tests that he said of further devolution proposals were that they should um, help to make Scotland a more prosperous country with job-creating powers, a fairer society, powers to tackle inequality, and they should give Scotland a stronger and clearer voice on the international stage. Now, it's difficult to see mm. any of those tests being met mm. within within the, the confines of the proposals that are there, unless you apply it, it's quite vaguely worded, of course, unless you apply it to some of the tax proposals or imply it to the welfare proposals. But that does hint at um, the Scottish Government, at least under current First Minister, um, mm. pushing, engaging with the process but seeking to push it further uh, than the three parties have been willing to go so far. Mm-hmm. Mm. Uh, there's, there's an echo there of that point in the second leader, leaders debate when, when Alex Salmond put Alistair yes. Darling on the spot and say, can you, can you name yes. three of your powers yes. which will yep. uh, create jobs in Scotland? It's hard to define what that would be, yes, except yes. for uh, flexibility on corporation tax rates would be the obvious thing, because that was one of the, the proposals uh, for action by an independent Scotland. And it is conceivable that you can have differential corporation tax rates within the UK. It's being actively discussed in the case of Northern Ireland. Uh, and uh, one, one might imagine that this is one of the areas where the SNP will add uh, a different perspective to the debate. And it, it again, it connects to some extent uh, to the Liberal Democrats' mm-hmm. proposals, which have been open at least to assigning corporation tax revenues from Scotland, uh, raised in Scotland, to the Scottish Parliament. And it, it opens up that possibility of new coalitions being formed around aspects of the further reaching, uh, further reaching devolution agenda. Mm. Charlotte, will we take some comments from Twitter? Do you have anything? Uh, Question? Uh, not too much at the moment, so hopefully people can continue tweeting in, but not too much on that. Okay, then. Um, so we move on then to our next uh, theme, which is the future of the UK. Um, Derek Holland asks, will the promise made by David Cameron for more powers for England by the English help or hinder the discussions of more devolved powers for Scotland. I feel that although the talks should be combined, it could cause either limited changes or a knee-jerk quick fix due to the tight timescale. Is that what we want? Nicola? Um, no. Mm. <laughs> knee-jerk quick fixes are, are really <coughs> uh, what we should be looking for because uh, they're usually not sustainable. Um, but, I mean... It, I was concerned, I think, when it, when the implication was that the two processes would be um, tied together, almost the one conditional on the other. Um, so I think that's that can uh, adds further complications when there are already quite a lot of complications and, and things to be ironed out. Um, that doesn't seem to be the case anymore. The soundings in the last few days have suggested that they will... Um, be parallel processes but not necessarily conjoined processes and I think that that's probably probably a good thing but there are clearly um, broader political debates at play here Um, the issue there is a genuine issue, I'm sure Charlie will talk about it in a minute, there is a genuine issue, a genuine concern within England about the way that England is governed and I think the the political parties at the Westminster level do need to uh, address that and um, find ways to um, help to secure consent within England or to ignore it is to um, potentially provoke problems further down the line but there are clearly electoral pressures uh, from UKIP and perhaps from others um, which are driving that process too um, but I think I'll, I'll pass over to my good colleague here who has been active in actively thinking about these issues for a long time Thank you, Nicola. One, one thing to say about the, the parallel processes that have been set in train. Uh, initially in the Prime Minister's statement on the early morning of the 19th of September, this was presented as two things which have to move together at the same pace. Uh, there's been a move away from that, as Nicola has said. Uh, but don't expect that there won't be spillovers, especially from the Scottish debate into England, uh, the, the cheerleaders for additional uh, consideration for England in, in the political system of the UK are on the Conservative backbenches, backbenches. and one of the, the things that they stress particularly is the perceived um, additional unfair 
uh, treatment that, that Scotland is getting. Scotland votes no and it gets more. That's unfair. Uh, and I think as the, the offer to Scotland clarifies, we're going to hear rather more about that. It's one of the interesting dynamics that's been let loose um, by the, the, the follow-on, uh, the chain reaction of events after the referendum, that it's creating national discourses which are defining themselves, at least in part, in, in opposition to one another. So the English discourse is in opposition to Scotland. To some extent, there's a discourse in Wales which is in opposition to Scotland about the financing arrangements for, uh, for devolution. So we're seeing parties reconfiguring their relationships with each other. We're also seeing different national debates engaging with each other in probably quite unpredictable ways. And Charlie, to move on to, to Joan Greenleaf's question, um, she asks, um, could Charlie please clarify in simple terms what the Mackay report recommends? She says, that I've read the report, including the executive summary, but she still feels a bit hazy about exactly what action the Commission recommends that the government should take. So you were involved in a commission looking at this idea of the English question at England's place in the Union. And yeah. Why was that and what did, what did it recommend? Well, I'm sorry to hear that the, the report which I helped to write um, leaves haze in its wake rather than clarity. Um, uh, it, it, is, it is a long and involved report, uh, and there, there's lots of, of quite detailed uh, stuff in there about parliamentary procedure. And I don't really think that's the point of the report. Uh, I think there are two things which precede that and from which the stuff on parliamentary procedure flows. Uh, the first, and, and Nicola has, has mentioned this, is uh, a genuine sense of discontent among people across England about the way they're governed. Um, there is um, something like a democratic deficit which is being experienced in England. Uh, there is a sense that there are different concerns in England and they are not recognised by the political system as currently uh, configured. And the way that people appear to want them to be recognised is to have some kind of England-wide expression of an English political will. Uh, we hear a lot about regions, and we're hearing a lot of, about, at the moment about city regions as a, as a potential reform to, to accelerate in England. This is not something which is in the mind of the citizen when thinking about democratic deficit. Maybe good for economic development, and that's a, a fine reason to think about city regions. But it's not going to solve the democratic deficit problem. That has to be, in our analysis, something that gives England as a whole an institutional uh, expression. And we found through, through public attitudes research that the most popular um, means to give England that institutional expression would be to modify the procedures of the House of Commons uh, to, give, uh, to, to, to produce uh, specific ways of dealing with legislation that has to do with England alone. Second really important thing um, was a point of principle that we tried to establish in the report, which we drew in analogy from the principles surrounding the devolution settlements. We have a, an unusual constitutional founding fundamental principle in the UK, and that is that Parliament is sovereign, that no one Parliament can bind the next, that Parliament is the institution which can, whenever it likes, in effect, rewrite the rules. Um, Parliament has uh, agreed, voluntarily as it were, not to exercise that sovereignty in relation to powers devolved to Scotland, Wales and Northern Ireland. And we were looking for an equivalent principle that might apply to the representatives of England, English constituencies, uh, in the House of Commons, uh, with a language, I, I forget the, ex the exact words, but that the, that the full House would not normally, not normally, overall the majority view expressed by uh, representatives of English constituencies on matters primarily to do with England. It could do, the whole House could do that, so if for example there were a, a, a Labour government whose majority across the UK was made by Scottish MPs, it could do, but it would have to account for that at the next UK election in English constituencies and, and we thought that would be some deterrent to using uh, uh, Scottish MPs to create a majority overruling the expressed view of, of the English. And that principle is, is the core. Stuff on parliamentary procedure, the complicated stuff that follows, is not. That's about giving effect to that principle. The key thing is that principle.
So your proposals in the Mackay Commission wouldn't risk this the two classes of MP. We've heard a lot about that um, during this debate. So the proposals in the Mackay Commission would, would keep intact that all UK MPs in principle have the, the right to vote on everything. But through some elegant changes in parliamentary procedure would entrench this principle about England voting on English issues. Uh, that, that's e exactly the case. Um, there was a strong concern not to have, uh, formally speaking, two classes of MPs, but I, I think there would be a consequence uh, of, of those reforms because it would make uh, winning a majority of seats in England a real priority for those parties aspiring to, uh, to run the government of the UK. Uh, and it would require, I, I think, a differentiation of message by those parties to uh, an English set of constituencies in the same way those parties are already used to offering a distinct message for Scottish Parliament elections and uh, equivalently in Wales and Northern Ireland. There would have to be, in effect, might not get called this, but an English Labour Party, an English Conservative Party, articulating views on certain matters which are views uh, relevant to issues with an England-wide reach only and not to a UK-wide reach. Nicola, do you, want, do you want to say anything about that? So the, you, this is a more incremental change than an English Parliament? This is something... It, it's a more incremental change than an English Parliament. We considered an English Parliament. Mm -hmm. um, there, are, there are a number of obstacles. Many people think that it would be very difficult... Um, to make a symmetrical federal system with an English Parliament like the Scottish Parliament uh, work, given the size uh, of England in the UK. I'm, I'm not sure I necessarily find that a compelling argument. Uh, I think there would be, uh, no doubt, real resistance to the idea of new institutions, new costs, uh, uh, more politicians. I don't think we're in a position which, where, where that would easily carry uh, popular support. Great. I hope that's cleared things up for, for Joan about the, about the Mackay Commission. I, I hope so, Joan. I hope so. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be back next week if there are, if there are further questions. Um, do we have anything on Twitter, Charlotte? Yeah, uh, yeah uh, a few things. So uh, Donald is asking um, whether, whether any of the panel think personally that the UK could proceed by becoming a federation, so the ideas of federalism. And uh, Morwenna Griffiths is asking, could an initial settlement within the timetable be followed by a more considered one later? Could you have that um, different approach? And then also another comment from Morwenna on the, um, on the Future Learn discussion. And is talking about, obviously, we've, we've just discussed ideas of English Parliament and things like that. But how the balance of power within a Westminster Parliament might change if more people vote SNP and Green in Scotland following uh, what we've just seen in the referendum. Okay, did any of those questions? Yeah, lots of take questions them. in there. Yeah. Lots of issues. I mean, I'll, I'll take the one on, on the settlement. Right. I mean, I think that's um, I think that's a really interesting thought and, a, mm. and, and probably a likely scenario where a, a short-term um, plan uh, goes into legislation and then there would be some further consideration later on. But you have to bear in mind that any new legislation now is likely to take quite a long time to implement. So the Scotland Act 2012, which um, introduced um, in the main income tax powers, borrowing powers, these will not come into effect until 2016. So that's taken four years. Now, if you are implement introducing new proposals which essentially build on that, then it might not take quite so long next time. Um, but I mentioned earlier the welfare proposals. I mean, this would be wholly new to devolve some areas of welfare and it's extraordinarily difficult to, do, to implement uh, that kind of change given the way that Social Security is designed in the UK. It's a very, very centralised system and unpacking that, disentangling it, it's in incredibly complicated. So even um, if that's planned this time, um, that might take quite a long time to implement. Mm. So um, yes, it's, we can foresee that um, there would be further reflection down the line, um, but that doesn't take place in a vacuum. All the while, there's an electoral cycle, there is party political debate, there is further constitutional debate, and all of that takes place to feed into uh, whichever processes unfold. So 
you know, reiterate the, the point I started out with. It, this, I don't think this ends mm. the constitutional debate in Scotland. It just continues. It's part of the dynamic of our politics. Charlie, do you want to pick up on that or talk about federalism or perhaps we'll leave federalism to next week? I'll perhaps leave federalism for next week. I've just, right. I've just noticed a, a comment from Ian Cook Turner about what English issues are. <coughs> Uh, and that's a very, very interesting uh, point. Uh, and it, it, it reminds me of a, a discussion I had this morning um, with a, a doctoral student from uh, University of Toronto who's also a learner on, uh, on our uh, independence referendum MOOC and who may be, may be watching, who was, who was asking me about um, why it is that uh, in Scotland there has been such a divergence on higher education policy uh, from from England, uh, my point in response to him and and um, perhaps also to Ian is that actually the Scottish Parliament's position is one which is showing much greater continuity with the the wider post-war political tradition on higher education, free higher education, than is uh, that uh, uh, than is the policies introduced by the UK Parliament for England. And I think that may well reflect a sense of difference in England, where there is a, a greater openness to uh, the private financing of public services in various ways. And that might provide an, a neat illustration, because I don't think Scotland diverged. I think England, with the support of, of MPs from uh, England, and one or two from Scotland uh, as well, helping to make the majority, um, has a different way of articulating issues around public services and the role of private finance and the role of market mechanisms than appears to be the case in Scotland. Thanks, and thank you very much um, for all your all your um, questions and comments on that theme. We move on to our next theme today, which is the implications for parties. And Anna asks, um, how will the resignation of Alex Salmond affect the future of the SNP and how will it affect their voters? Nicola, how do, you, how do you think Alex Salmond's... Could we invite you to speculate uh, on the resignation of Alex Salmond and its effect on the SNP? Yeah, I mean, very difficult to say mm. for sure, but um, on the assumption that his successor is Nicola Sturgeon, which everyone expects, um, then I would expect more continuity than change, both in the ideological profile of the party... Uh, and its approach to competing in elections, um, perhaps a little more um, social democratic than mm-hmm. than it currently is, although it's broadly in that mode anyway. Um, but I mean, uh, more interesting in a sense will be who takes up the role of her deputy and whether um, the party tries to balance out the sort of um, centre left Glasgow. Um, presence image that Nicola Sturgeon will have um, with something that appeals more towards what we consider to be the traditional heartlands of the SNP in the northeast of Scotland and uh, campaigning around issues of fisheries and, and mm. land reform and so on. Um, and of course that decision isn't in the hands of the leadership. That's a decision that is in the hands of the members and that probably will lead us into uh, the next discussion on the extraordinary change to mm. membership mm. Mm. of the Scottish National Party in particular, but also the, the Green Party mm. as well. Do you want to say something about that, Charlie, before we move on to discussing membership and civic engagement? I'm, I'm, I'm keen to go on to the membership. Yeah. Right, let's move on to <laughs> civic engagement then. So Laura McNeil asks... Um, oh, no, 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 sorry, I, I beg your pardon. I did want to say something about the, the, the influx into the SNP. OK. Um, because I think it may have something to do with the civic engagement Okay. Point. Uh, we, we don't know yet where all these members have come from, who they are. Um, I think it's quite plausible to to imagine that many of them are people who were energised by the the independence campaign uh, and who were very active in in a dynamic grassroots movement, which was in many respects beyond the reach of of the SNP or in in a an informal relationship at best with the SNP. Uh, I'm thinking of the radical independence campaign, the, the, the activities around the Common Wheel uh, initiative, uh, the National Collective uh, engaging with the, the artistic community. Now, if, if the influx of, of, of members is from, from those groups, which is 
uh, a set of groups clearly to the left of where the SNP currently is, uh, then there is likely to be uh, pressure from within the SNP to reflect uh, the views of, of those new members. And of course, as Nicola says, it's, uh, it's a highly democratised party when it comes to, to choosing its leaders. Um, so that influx is going to be um, very decisive, I doubt, in, in, in influencing whether or not Nicola Sturgeon is going to be the leader, uh, but certainly who the deputy uh, is. Uh, and that may well be significant for the SNP's future in the lines that Nicola was saying, because I suspect most of the influx has been from the west of Scotland. Uh, and may have less attachment to the kinds of issues uh, which have sustained the SNP as a party of strength in the northeast of Scotland. I'm just reading um, the latest on the membership as well. So as of 12 o'clock when we started this broadcast, um, the membership was sitting at 57,000, and that's more significantly more than double where it was last Thursday. I mean, that's just... Um, Obviously, a huge opportunity for the Scottish National Party as uh, a party going into two elections back to back, but huge challenges as well on the the, the degree of power potentially uh, that the new members would bring, um, particularly if they are coming from a particular part of the country or a particular ideological persuasion, and that can influence the the direction that the party goes in. We don't know at this stage if that's a sustainable level of membership mm. or if it's a short-term effect post-referendum. Um, mm. We don't know if it will change the way that the party operates, because if this is people coming in from a grassroots type of campaigning, um, they might not be overly enamoured with you know, arcane conference procedures and remits back and things like this, I mean, the, which might make them just disappear again or it might make them want to change the way politics takes place within political parties, within uh, the Scottish National Party in particular. Um, but for the Greens, I think mm. it's also very interesting to observe because although it's on a much smaller scale, the transformational impact of the Greens increasing their membership um, by several thousand, it could be huge. I mean, it could give that party resources, degree of professionalism perhaps that it hasn't always enjoyed um, and help it to transform itself into an effective campaigning machine. Um, so, you know, really interesting times ahead to watch how that unfolds and watch whether or not it is sustained. Absolutely, real opportunities and challenges for, for both parties going forward, I think. Um, we'll just, we take this final question because it links into civic engagement. Um, this campaign, says Laura McNeil, has, has seen real engagement of people who genuinely feel the result may impact on their lives. Um, could the grassroots campaign methods spill over into the general election campaigns? Do you think we can sustain this level of activism beyond the referendum? I mean, I suppose my perspective on it is that it's easy to get people engaged, or easier to get people engaged in a historic decision where they perhaps feel that their vote really counts and it's not mediated but, you know, through political parties or to the negotiation between political parties. After an election, it feels like, here's my vote and this is how it links to decision. Is, is it possible to sustain these people in the, the more mundane politics of everyday general elections? I think it would be very difficult. I mean, I think, first of all, we have to be careful uh, not to assume that all the passion and engagement was only on one side of the referendum mm. campaign. Yes, the grassroots movement on the yes side was uh, the more visible, the more active, the more numerous, uh, but there was also passion and engagement um, on the no side as well. Um, but I think you're right. I mean, I think that the referendum combined um, conventional politics with issue politics and, mm. and imbued it all with a sense of history. Um, and that isn't going to be something that you can translate into the general election or even the Scottish Parliament election. So I think it will be difficult to sustain that kind of level of, of activity. I don't think we'll see the high turnouts that in, in the elections that we saw last week. Um, but it could affect the way that parties campaign, um, particularly if they are able to mobilise around particular issues relevant to, to the election campaigns. Um, what we will see. Can I, can I add a different perspective mm. uh, on that? On that. It, it was really remarkable, the extent of civic engagement that we saw. The, the turnout level was a record-breaking turnout level on a, on a nationwide scale uh, in Scotland. Uh, and and there, is, there is a sense that this, this, is, this is good energy that would be good 
for Scotland uh, if, if it were if it were harnessed, and that's one of the reasons why why I think that the the timetable for considering additional devolved powers for Scotland is is problematic or disappointing, uh, because it allows for something like a three week consultation period uh, in November, um, which is clearly um, insufficient. To, to harness that kind of grassroots level engagement ac across Scotland that we have seen. Though I'm quite sure that whatever proposals come out of this process would be stronger if they had been seen to go through that kind of, of public community level uh, discussion. Um, so I, I'm rather hoping actually that some of that energy does persist and it forces its way into the considerations which are going to be done as a party deal, as a, as a a deal largely behind closed doors, two representatives from each party. I really hope that um, the civic engagement we've seen puts pressure on that process to open it up and to, to listen. Because I, I think there's a danger that um, the, the civic engagement, much appreciated as it was, will not be appreciated in that highly pressured, <laughs> highly, uh, really short time scale that, that the parties have set for themselves. Thanks, Charlie. Um, Charlotte, any final comments from Twitter before we... Yes, we had one um, from Donald who was sort of commenting on the fact that we had in incredibly high turnout, um, which we've all acknowledged, but whether there's any information on those 15% that did not vote and, and whether there's been any analysis there. And then just a question um, for Alan, going back to uh, our discussion of parties from Anne Townsley on the discussion board, um, wanted to know what... Well, I'm directing this to you, given your research, um, whether the Conservative Party in Scotland might be impacted by this and whether they might see a resurgence um, because of the no vote and, and the role that they played in that campaign. I think they were certainly hoping um, for that, and I think um, towards the end people were quite pleased with Ruth Davidson's performance. Mm -hmm. I think people would feel that she'd mm -hmm. raised herself in stature and raised her, her public profile as well. It would be interesting to see whether the Conservative Party can harness um, some of the energy that Charlie was talking about um, into the future. I think it's certainly true to say that it's energised the base of the Conservative Party, the idea that the union was under threat, it's certainly energised activists in the Conservative Party. But it would be interesting to see if they can match that up with... Um, a type of policy and image that we can go into the, the 2016 Scottish Parliament elections with. Charlie, did you want to say something? I, I, not on the Conservative Party. I, that's your specialist subject, um, and, and I, I shan't challenge you on, on that ground. But I, I did want to say something about the 15% the who didn't mm. vote. Um, we, we don't know much beyond um, informed speculation at the moment. However, uh, on the 6th of October, and, and I realise that's it's after the, the end of, 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 of the course, but on the 6th of October, um, Ailsa Henderson, who we saw here um, uh, last time out, uh, will be uh, presenting initial findings from a special study of the referendum, which had a panel of, of voters consulted twice before the referendum, once afterwards. Uh, and uh, she will be giving us some insights into that question. And all of that research will be uh, available to you, the learners, uh, once the course have finished, has finished on the Future UK and Scotland website, futureukandscotland.ac.uk. Uh, keep up with the continuing debate on there. And you can also sign up to the event and come along and it's free. Yes, indeed. Can, can I just say one thing on turning? Yep. Because it, makes, we, it didn't quite go as we anticipated. We had, I think in previous discussions for the MOOC, we'd talked about the high turnout probably being of most benefit to the Yes campaign because it would bring out those who didn't normally participate in the electoral process. And what we found on the night was that um, it, it didn't have that effect because those areas of the country that normally have higher turnout still had higher turnout. So in a sense it neutralised the impact that increasing participation uh, would have on the, the, the debate between yes and no. Great, a good um, thought to finish on. So th my thanks again to Charlie and Nicola for joining us and to Charlotte for feeding us your comments and your questions. You can join us again next week for our final online seminar when we'll be discussing what next. <laughs>